Hello and welcome to this audio commentary for Kenneth Anger's Puce Moment. I'm Stephen Brumer of Art and Trash. Filmed in 1949, released in this form in 1970, Puce Moment was conceived as a kind of proof of concept for a feature-length project that Anger was developing at the time, which would have been called Puce Women. What might Puce Women have been? According to Anger, it was intended as an ode to the fading image of the silent film goddess, taking the form of an episodic tour of symbolic women, each representing a different part of the day. This episode is inspired, in a sense, by these glamorous vintage dresses that once belonged to the filmmaker's grandmother, who had been a costume designer for the stars of that silent world, that lavish epic that would come to loom so large in Anger's broader project through his multi-volume history of the perversity and indulgence of the movie business, Hollywood Babylon, an extraordinary imaginative work of yellow journalism fact-checked via telepathy. We spend the opening minutes with these dresses, shaken and tossed aside by an unseen hand, as if moving of their own volition. This is a clue that Puce Moment is a kind of ghost story, an act of animating the beautiful things of the past in vivid color. As to the vividness of that color, note that Puce Moment was shot by Curtis Harrington, another young queer Los Angeles experimental filmmaker of the era whose own work at the time was primarily black and white, but who also shot rich, luminous color films with esoteric themes, like The Assignation and The Wormwood Star before turning away from experimental filmmaking to pursue commercial genre cinema. Like other films that Anger made at that time, for example, Fireworks made just two years prior, one can take this simple sequence as a kind of psychic event, pivoting around the figure of a glamorous flapper who seems to have stepped out of the dance halls of the 1920s, or for that matter, out of a myth and into a cloistered world of enhanced sensuality, cut with cheap tinsel, hard baubles, and soft satin. When we first see Yvonne Marquis, the puce woman, she appears as if revealed by this tunnel of outfits. The frock she's selected she lifts, but her eyes and its movement as it comes down onto her suggest again the operations of a supernatural force, Though Anger would move on from the project, this sketch, as it was in 1949, wasn't yet abandoned. Like other films of Anger's, it would have a long incubation, and the version that circulates has a soundtrack of psychedelic rock recorded 20 years later, in 1970, songs written by Jonathan Halper that impose on these scenes a further degree of anachronism. The film becomes a tunnel of eras. A sound particular to 1970 accompanies images of even then old Hollywood, not yet decaying in 1949, occupied by a ghost of the jazz age, this wondrous wide-eyed starlet, preparing by the magic of her parlor to take her borzois for a walk, borzois being creatures of speed, but also cherished icons of aristocratic decadence dogs whose otherworldly elegance made them popular with the czars. Yvonne Marquis was Anger's cousin. This is her only screen appearance. She moved to Mexico not long after the film was made. Puce moment is more than anachronism. It annihilates the distance between nostalgic fantasy and the immediate now of pleasure. Here in the sanctum of this preening, lazy, beautiful hermit, all things past are present again, and even in its formal semblance to the music video, having no sound but song, it gains another echo, anticipating an era that hadn't yet arrived. Her world is a luxurious one of heels and perfumes in ornate tinted bottles of pastel haze. To call her a puce woman, or to call this a puce moment, is in itself a strange invitation to interpretation as the closest things to Puce in this film, aside from a highlight here or there and the curtain behind her, are the pink blushes 
that occasionally overtake her pale complexion. This puce moment contains an eternity, an immense range in time. As she reclines on a chaise longue, the light ebbs, and she is transported to the outside of her stately home. She poses, her borzois in tow, ready to descend into a world we'll never see, but for how alien her life is, we might presume she descends, a goddess, into our mortal reality. For years I thought of these borzois as a kind of Cerberus image, guarding the gates of this sanctum itself an underworld, if not the hell of Hades, then at least an afterlife of lost time. Their presence, like all things in the film, is provocative, another testament to Anger's precise mise-en-scene. Even when his films bear elements that could be mistaken for spontaneity, the world he creates through them is one of careful arrangement. And even as the puce woman departs, who is this obscured figure that looks down on her from the balcony above? In Anger's filmmaking, there are always more gods and goddesses. Extra.